Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. Bertram Ramsey was the mastermind behind the evacuation of the BEF from France in those crucial weeks at the end of May and the start of June in 1940. It was his planning, determination and leadership which helped evacuate around 338,000 men from the beaches of Dunkirk. But for this Royal Navy officer, still officially retired, it was just one landmark operation he was involved with. Ramsey will go on to take part in the invasion of North Africa, Sicily, Normandy and for Overlord he will be in overall command of the naval component of the D-Day landings, Neptune. But Admiral Bertram Ramsey is not now a household name, overshadowed by some of his contemporaries. Well, hopefully in this episode we'll try and put the record straight. I'm joined by Brian Izzard. Brian's book, Mastermind of Dunkirk and D-Day, The Vision of Admiral Bertram Ramsey, is the first major biography of Ramsey for 50 years. But before we get started... I'd just like to say a big thank you to all those listeners who support the podcast by becoming patrons. That small donation from a couple of hundred of you is really appreciated and it does go a long way to helping me put the show together. Now, if you're not already a patron but do enjoy the podcast twice a month and perhaps would like a bit more World War II chat, I do make extras available when I have them which I think the keen armchair historian might enjoy. So if you go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast or ww2podcast.com and click on donate for details. Right, let's get cracking. Brian, thanks for joining me. Um Bertram Ramsey, am I right in saying his family had a had a military tradition? He does. His father was an officer in a cavalry regiment, the fourth Queen's Own Hussars, but they had quite a few other family members in the army. I think one naval relation, but mostly they were in the army. So Ramsay was uh, born into a military family. He was was born in um, Hampton Court, where his father was serving in the the barracks there. So that was in um, January 1883. His father was Scottish, but his mother was Irish. Uh, As I say, he was born in Hampton Court, but he he considered himself a Scot. I wonder if that's less contentious if you consider yourself a Scot. I mean, I don't know which part of the uh, island his mother was from. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, she, she was from the south. Ah, so it, you know, yeah. it, it might certainly, certainly uh, from 1916 onwards, it might be less, much less contentious if he considers himself a Scot. Exactly, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, despite being born in what was in Middlesex, um, just to uh, confuse the picture. He became very independent at an early age because his father was serving all over the place. For about five years, he was virtually on his own, well, left with family and friends um, because his father was posted to India. So off his father went and so did his mother. So he didn't see them for five years. So he developed this very independent streak. So how did he get into the Navy with his uh, sort of slightly more of a background with, with an, an army background? Well, he had two brothers and um, they both went in the army and following in their father's footsteps. And I think an army career was more expensive in those days than a naval career. So the two elder sons went into the army and um, sort of used the family cash that way. And it was cheaper for um, a younger son to be sent to um, to join the navy. <laughs> it's a wonderful way of working out your career, isn't it? How much you can afford? Uh, yes, well, it, that's what happened in those days. I, I don't think he minded going into the navy. He went to a special school um, outside Portsmouth, which um, trained people for cadet ships. So he joins. He joined as a cadet when he was fifteen. It's remarkably young, isn't it? I mean, it, 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 it's um, some of these chaps by the time of the Second World War have tr- have had tremendously long careers because they've been in from fifteen, uh, and they're quite young. He's quite early on. He's posted to HMS uh, Dreadnought. I wondered if that was a reflection upon him, the quality, the quality of uh, of, of a young officer uh, that someone's earmarked him for. What it must have been Britain's predominant battleship of the time? Uh, it was a breakthrough 
in warship design, yes. I mean, it was very heavily armed. It was the first of the dreadnoughts. Uh, but he had served in other ships before then. He joined the Navy when he was 15 in 1898. So he'd had quite a lot, a lot of experience in other ships. And he had actually got his first campaign medal during the Somaliland campaign, which was a kind of amphibious operation. Yeah, that, that, curiously, that's for actually a land action, isn't he? Isn't that... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> t- t- typical, isn't it? You, uh, your, 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 your first uh, decoration isn't for actually for, for necessarily for your seamanship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Well, they, they did come from the sea, but um, it was ma- mainly a land campaign. So. <laughs> My assumption is it's a, it's a good posting, is Dreadnought, though, to, uh, to be sent to. Everyone must have been wanting to be on it. Yes, yes. I mean, it was a revolutionary design, the new era of battleships. It would have been a great change for him, um, having served in other <clears throat> what then became obsolete um, obsolete ships. Yeah, obsolete overnight. What amused was he's putting put in charge of a turret, and I never quite it never quite occurred to me that you have uh, you know an officer in each. T- you obviously do, but you know <laughs> when you, until it's pointed out, you know he's in charge of a turret. Well, it was quite a, it was quite a junior officer at that, that time. So, uh, but these these were big big turrets. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and he requests a posting to signals. I mean, is that a good career move to be sent to the well? At the time, signals? at the time, gunnery was considered the main stepping stone for promotion. He was very um, conscious of his appearance and not, in a way, not wishing to get his hands dirty. So gunnery was a bit of a dirty, <laughs> dirty job, and signals appealed to him because it led to the movement of ships tactics that kind of thing so that's what he specialized in is that thing about the navy where it's all about aggression isn't it and they're always expected to be a- attacking their adversary this old nelsonian idea and which is what very much what i guess where gunnery is which possibly why it's always been seen as uh you know the stepping stone for um, uh the career ladder mm. That that was the main sort of career <clears throat> stepping stone yes yes so is it from a signals officer uh, he, he's also sent to the um, Royal Navy War Staff College course. Now, is is that a usual uh, course for a signals officer to go, the Staff College course? Well, the Staff College course was a fairly new thing. So I'm not sure if – I don't think just because he was doing signals that he necessarily went there because of that. But he was, he was seen as um, a bright star. So that's why you ended up going on the staff college course, which was in Portsmouth. Because they're usually, they're usually. Uh, so, so from, I was thinking from the army point of view, they're usually interesting. Not so much, I think, for, for, for what they teach, for, for who else was there and the connections uh, that these people make. And you, you know, it's not unusual for them to go back and, which indeed he does, goes back and train. And all these connections usually then loom later in their uh, later in their careers. So uh, the First World War is is uh, always important in any World War Two officer's career. How was Ramsey's First World War? Um, it was fairly quiet. He didn't see a great deal of action. The, the most important phase for him was was being part of the Dover Patrol. Strangely, he didn't see all that much action. <laughs> What's the Dover Patrol do? Is it, it just literally keep the channel clear for the um, uh, the traffic? Uh, of moving the BNF, B, BEF backwards and forwards? Partly, but also to protect the coastline. And um, there was a lot of um, German destroyer activity in the channel, you know, raiding. So they had to deal with that. Oddly enough, Ramsey took command of a famous destroyer, HMS Broke, which was involved in a major action with German destroyers. Uh, but that was under um, a previous captain. Ramsey took over the ship after it had achieved all this glory. That was is that is that when Ram, when they broke rammed the German ship and they were physically repelling borders and it sounds like something from uh, like from uh, Nelsonian times, yes, yeah, <laughs> yes, it yeah, was a wild, horn it was a Wild action, but of course Ramsey was not in command of the ship at the time, so someone else got the glory. Now, and how does he find? Uh, Direct command of a you know of a, of a, of a, uh, a destroyer. Um, well, he loved it, um, but it it wasn't his first command. He was in his first command was a monitor. You know, one of those uh, small ships with a huge gun. 
but even then he didn't see a great deal of action with that. And then, of course, while he was in command of Broke, the First World War was coming to an end. He had a run in with um, Admiral Keyes, who was the commander of the Dover Patrol. They fell out and Ramsey did not get his usual DSO. He does get meant to be flag officers at Jellico, which in 1919, which struck me as being a, 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 a quite a good assignment. Yeah, he, he gradually built up his, his career after the First World War. <laughs> Those interwar years are usually put people, military's careers in slow motion. And it, it's, uh, it struck me when I was thinking about interwar careers in slow motion, how he produces a paper on how to paint a ship, which somehow seems... <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, he was a perfectionist. He liked his ships, you know, to be the best in the fleet. He went to extremes to make sure that they, they did. And as you, as you mentioned, I mean, he, was, he managed to write reams of a report on how to paint a warship properly. You know, the brush strokes have to go this way and then that way, and uh, goodness knows what. And, you know, he checked everything. And his ship's company soon knew what he wanted and how things should be done. Yeah, it's a, it's a level of fastidiousness sh- explaining to someone how, how, how to physically use the brush one way and then another. Extreme level of detail. Uh, so by 35, he's promoted to be Rear Admiral... And Chief of Staff to Admiral Backhouse, who's commander of Home Fleet. Now, on paper, that would seem to be a good uh, career posting. Is that the case? It seems at first, but of course it, it turned out to be one of his worst posting. He was promoted Rear Admiral. He and Backhouse had been friends for a long time, you know, early on in their careers. Backhouse had been serving in the Mediterranean, and then he was given the post of Commander-in-Chief Home Fleet, and he needed a chief of staff. And um, Ramsey just been promoted rear admiral. He asked Ramsey if he'd like to be chief of staff. Ramsey thought about it and thought it would be a, a good career move. In fact, it was the opposite. Backhouse was um, a workaholic. When Ramsey took up his appointment, it was okay for a couple of weeks. And then Backhouse complained that he wasn't having much to do because Ramsey was filtering all the reports and messages and it ended up with with backhouse ordering ramsey to send everything through to him first and he would deal with it so ramsey who was a hard-working officer and very conscientious ended up not doing much at all and he that was not his style as the months drew on things got much worse and it ended up with ramsey saying that he wanted a different posting he no longer wanted to be chief of staff. And of course, in the higher circles of the Navy, that was seen as unprecedented. And it did not go down well with the then first sea lord. He didn't back him at all. It wasn't, Ramsey doesn't seem backed at all by, uh, by the Navy. There seems to be no understanding at all for, for his position. I mean, he did have friends in high places, but he was virtually told, you know, you have to work with the commander in chief, whatever goes on. You know, you can't say, I don't like this, it's not working. You know, head down and get on with it. But of course, that was not in Ramsey's nature. So he wanted a different posting, but the first sea lord did not like setting this kind of precedent. So in effect, Ramsey was hung up to dry for a couple of years and then told that he would um, be retired. When you're put on the retirement list, does that mean, which is what happens to Ramsey in 38, does that mean you're retired from the Navy or you're going to retire from the Navy because we haven't got a post for you right now? No, it's it's the end of the career, really. But in retirement, when he was told he'd be retired, he was given the rank of um, Vice Admiral. And in a way, it worked, it worked for him because he headed back up to um, Scotland. He had a wife and two children. He enjoyed country pursuits. It was it was a good break for him, but then then of course the Second World War was looming. So why does he get taken back on? I mean, it's, because he, he's he's sent to become flag officer at Dover. So who's championing him, presumably at the Admiralty, to um, give him a job? It strikes me as being a, a good job, flag officer at Dover, isn't it? Well, it turned out to be a very good, very important posting. But with some irony, the person who decided to give Ramsey that posting was none other than Backhouse, who had become the first sea lord. 
And I think I think Backhouse probably felt guilty about the treatment of Ramsey. And of course, Ramsey had all had all this experience of the Dover Patrol and the First World War, so it made sense to give him that posting in Dover. Was he keen to come back? I think he was a bit torn because he liked being with his family in Scotland. Um, he liked the life there, but he was um, dedicated to service, and he knew that um, there would be a crisis. So he sort of gave it a hundred percent. wasn't He wasn't bitter about his um, treatment by the Admiralty. So, what are the responsibilities of the flag officer uh, at Dover in 1939? I mean, obviously, this is going to change, but you know, is it a prestigious job? Were people you know, clamouring for that posting, or did everyone want a a job at sea? I, th- I think most um, naval officers prefer to be at sea. Um, I don't think I don't think the Dover posting was particularly glamorous, but it turned out to be a very important okay. posting. So, how does he find how does he find Dover when he arrives? He went there months before the war broke out and trying to set up there. There wasn't very much there for him in the way of facilities. In fact, he ended up in a hotel trying to uh, get things organised. And then a bit later, he moved to Dover Castle. As it turned out, I mean, um, things were moving pretty rapidly. So his posting became ever more important. Well, indeed. I mean, he'll have been overseeing all the BAF leaving for France, presumably. I mean, I presume Dover, I mean, Portsmouth, Portsmouth, Southampton and Dover must be the main exit points. Dover was one of the ports, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, I, I wonder if in, you know, 1939, 1940, had much planning been put in place for traffic coming in the opposite direction rather fast? Uh, had that ever been put to uh, Ramsey? I don't think so, no. I mean... They weren't expecting the BEF to come back so quickly. And that, that was the point. It was a crisis that suddenly unfolded. And, of course, they had this phony war for a long time. And, in fact, in fact, even Ramsey thought that maybe the, the whole thing would fizzle out, that the conflict would end without too much fighting or bloodshed. So, I mean, as, this, as the situation deteriorates uh, in France, uh, in sort of that May... Uh, of uh, 1940. At what point does Ramsey become directly involved in uh, the evacuation? I mean, is he told from the start right? It's it's your bag. I mean, how? I mean, at what point is he is is he synonymous with uh, Operation Dynamo? Is it his plan? Uh, that was cobbled together pretty quickly. But I mean, things were moving so rapidly in May 1940. The first key area was Calais. As the British and French troops were being pushed back towards the Dunkirk area, it was important to keep a port like Calais going to stop the German advance from that direction. So Calais was was important. Um, And after that fell, of course, the whole focus was on Dunkirk. It's not that far straight across the channel. Why does the Navy sort of take that um, roundabout route at times to get there? At one point, it's 172 miles that the the Navy take to get to uh, Dunkirk. I mean, obviously, you could, um, they couldn't go in a straight direction uh, because there were all sorts of hazards. German aircraft attacking, e-boats attacking. Along the French coast, there were a lot of um, sandbars and sandbanks. And, of course, mines were another problem. So they actually had to come up with three different routes. Um, and, and the longest one was turned out to be the safest. Did Ramsey have final say on everything for Operation Dynamo? I mean, did the Admiralty literally give him everything he asked for? More or less, because there just wasn't the time to um, sort of mess about with a chain of command. But he did get a lot of cooperation from other commands. And I think the Admiralty more or less gave him free reign. How much of Dynamo's success, the Dunkirk operation, was down to uh, Ramsey's leadership, Bertrand Ramsey's leadership? A great deal, I think. He has been described as the saviour of Dunkirk, and I think that's right. But he had a, he had a good team with him because he got his headquarters, um, the Dynamo headquarters, was in the tunnels beneath Dover Castle. So he had a lot of people assisting him. But he also chose people very carefully. Anyone who was not up to the job didn't last very long. And he had very good destroyer, minesweeper captains who showed a lot of courage. It, it struck me that his genius, 
Perhaps his he, he, was fight, he was getting the right men in the right place and then supporting their decisions, and and he kept pushing, which made him for that you know few weeks period fantastic for the job, the right man in the right place. Exactly, yeah. And considering he'd been discarded by the navy not that long ago, I mean, he sort of gave it a hundred percent. Great character, very determined person, the perfectionist. He did a, a masterful job. How well was he known before Dunkirk? My my assumption is after Dunkirk, he's a celebrity. Uh, a reluctant one, um, because he he made the point that if Dunkirk had been a complete failure, he would have been it would have been his head on the chopping block. But as it turned out, I mean, he did a fantastic job because originally they thought that um, the evacuation would last, I don't know, two or three days, and they might, with luck, get forty thousand back. But it lasted from. May 26th to June the 4th, and they brought back, is it 338,000 Allied personnel? It, what staggered me is how many they're getting on an hour, you know, 10,000 plus men an hour are embarking, which is just phenomenal. Well, that was Ramsey's destroyers and minesweepers and the ferries that brought back most of these troops. The myth of the little ships makes great reading, but it was actually the destroyers and minesweepers that brought back most of the most of the men. But presumably we're living with wartime propaganda of the uh, little ships that uh, stays with us. Yeah, they did play an important part because a lot of the men who were stuck on the beaches, the destroyers um, couldn't get in that close because of the tides and the sandbars and sandbanks. So they had to use a lot of yachts, motorboats, whalers to get men off the beaches into the ships. So at this period of the war, presumably he, he, he becomes, uh, you know, he becomes frequented with Churchill. You know, what's Ramsey's relationship with Churchill? He's one of those people that if he doesn't like anyone, Churchill, you, you're not always, uh, you don't always do very well. Uh, 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 and Dudley Pounds, you know, it is does Ramsey get on with it, with everybody at this period? Churchill paid a number of visits to um, Dover. They got on well. They both understood what was what was going on. But of course, um, Churchill had been in the army in his younger days, and he had actually served in Ramsey's father's regiment. And Churchill remembered that. So there was um, a meeting of minds. <laughs> it, it could be quite a small world, the British Army. And how did he get on with Dudley Pound? I don't think he had that many direct dealings um, because, I mean, he was, especially over Dunkirk, he was so busy. But he did challenge Dudley Pound, Pound, who was the first sea lord at that time. Um, because of the heavy destroyer losses during the evacuation, Pound withdrew some of the newer ships and Ramsey was left with were First World War veterans and he needed the, the newer, bigger destroyers and he persuaded Pound to send them back. So that was a challenge that worked. And I think without those ships, they would not have taken, a, um, taken off so many men. Now, he left at, at, uh, at, at Dover for uh, a, a couple of years. And he's really on the front line now, is, 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 is Dover of the War, which is probably not what he expected to be in 1939. Um, I, I think the, 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 the big, I might be wrong, but is, is the big uh, naval uh, action at Dover, then the, the Channel Dash in 42, which probably, was that a huge failure for Ramsey? He was obviously the, the man in charge, but there was quite a lack of coordination between the Navy and the Air Force. They weren't expecting these German ships to sort of sail through up the channel um, in daylight. <laughs> but it, it, was the, it was the RAF that failed to spot them in the first place. And by the time they did, they had to um, mount a very hurried operation. And uh, that was when the six swordfish were sent out, you know, these old very slow planes, torpedo bombers. Uh, biplanes as well, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it was a suicidal mission. But that's what they had to do first. And uh, suddenly they all 
all the planes failed to return. And also there were destroyers that were sent out, but they and motor torpedo boats. They failed as well to inflict any any damage on the on the Germans. It's a sizable you know, there's two Scharnhorst Blastel ships class battleships, the heavy cruiser Prince Eugene uh, with its escorts. It's a sizable. They, they were battle cruisers. Those those other ships. Right, battle cruisers. It was a it's a sizable amount of shipping that uh, slips through in daylight. Um, it I mean, does, did he come in? Ramsey come in for criticism initially, but um, there were there were a lot of failings elsewhere. Yeah, you know, they never quite got their act together there. But the irony is that although these ships slipped through and were you know, a major threat to Allied shipping. Two of them were um, struck mines in, during the dash. One was badly damaged. I, I wonder if the Channel Dash was any uh, reflection on why he swaps Dover for a desk in uh, Whitehall in, in 43. Is that, is, that, is that a promotion being sent to Whitehall? Ramsey wasn't really blamed for, for um, the, the Germans slipping through. They did have a court of inquiry. And it was immediately it was seen as a failure that these ships had got through. But of course, they ended up being bottled up in port. As Churchill reflected later, it was a kind of victory because these ships never became a threat again, you know, going out into the Atlantic. Yeah, I mean, Ramsey remained at Dover for a while after that. I mean, he was seen as a naval officer of growing importance. And he ended up planning the next big operation after the Americans joined the war. Uh, well, and this, this is where we get, this is where you can get frightfully lost a whole series of, of names from, you know, Roundup, Sledgehammer <laughs> and eventually Overlord. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. And if I hadn't had them written down, I could never necessarily tell you where, where Roundup and Sledgehammer all fit together with which way around which comes which. But yeah, he, he, he's the Senior Royal Navy Planning Officer for Roundup, which is the invasion of, of Europe. Uh, flag, he's the Flag of Officer Expeditionary Fleet. So, what, uh, what, what's he doing? And presumably this time he's also now working with the Americans. Yeah, of course, by this time the Americans were in the war. The Americans were very keen to um, launch an attack in Europe. But senior British officers, one of them, Alan Brooke, thought, hold on, you're not being realistic. So they managed to persuade the Americans to look elsewhere because German forces at that time in Europe, um, in France, Belgium, were so strong and of course, the American troops had very little battle experience. So it was stressed that it was important to develop the war gradually. Uh, presumably, he get, well, he will have come into contact with Eisenhower for the first time, who is part of Roundup. Um, do, 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 do we know how, uh, how, how his relationship was with Eisenhower? Uh, he, got on, he got on quite well with Eisenhower. It was the American General Marshall who was considered something of a problem because they thought he was unrealistic about um, the initial aims of dealing with Germany. I, I didn't write this down, because I, can't, I don't recall if it's in the book or not. Do we know he got on with King? <laughs> You'd say Marshall was the problem. Usually everyone says, well, when it comes to the Americans, King's the problem, Ernest King in charge of the Navy. Did, did he ever have any dealings with King? He was, King's dreadfully waspish, waspish, wasn't he? He was, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Ramsey, at that stage, did not have to deal directly with King, because that was, um, that was mainly Admiral Cunningham. There was quite a lot of tension early on about the way forward. Well, that's, that, that's reflected in how Roundup becomes Sledgehammer, and then it, it all gets put on hold for Torch. Now, this, this is why I've got me thinking, you know, all these people, their staff is working on a, a, a one invasion uh, of, of Europe, and then they get shift to... The same, I'm right in saying the same staff more or less shifts over... Uh, it's transferred over to North North Africa, uh, Eisenhower. But but Ramsey's not given the the top job. It goes to Cunningham. Now I wonder why it goes to Cunningham. Do we know how he feels about it? I mean, does he get on with Cunningham? He does get on with Cunningham. But Cunningham had been sent to um, Washington to uh, liaise with the Americans. It was sort of a, a job that he didn't want. He preferred to see more action. So I think he, there was a bit of tension between Cunningham and uh, Ramsey because Cunningham ended up being in command of the naval side for um, Operation Torch, um, the invasion of North, North Africa. But Ramsey accepted being deputy. 
it, it, again, we see a pattern. You know, Totch, I think, from the naval point of view, goes off rather well, doesn't it? Um, it does, yeah. I mean, it, there were three main landings, um, Casablanca, Oran, Algiers. Of course, they, had, they still had tensions with the Americans, especially King, who initially did not like the idea of American vessels being under British command. Um, so they, they came to a compromise and eventually they got torch underway in November 1942. I mean, there wasn't a huge amount of fighting on the ground, but it was it turned out a great success. Well, and then it got, it, it, it's, you, this is where we see the pattern emerging again, as Ramsey seems to be the go-to guy from previous landings when he's uh, uh, plans not just torch the landing stage, plants uh, Husky, which which I think is possibly a, a step up insofar as it's more of an assault landing than torch uh, probably was. Now, I wonder why he he's excelling this. Is it because of his, I don't know, staff court training background? It, you know, it's all about landings, presumably, but all about planning uh, and logistics, and they're not necessarily a fighting ship commander's job. I don't um, you know. No, no. And the training is very important because, um, you know, you have all these natural hazards like surf and uh, when you're sending landing craft in, uh, they have to be quite skillfully operated. But I think um, Cunningham was right for the overall picture. Ramsey was a man who his attention to detail was very important because I don't think Cunningham had that that sense of purpose. It, it strikes me as not necessarily being a traditional naval role, really, uh, being in charge of landings. It, it's frightfully important during the Second World War, uh, but perhaps before the Second World War, it, it hasn't really quite been as important. You know, the the the, the job that was that was the way that was the way forward. You know, amphibious landings, which of course Ramsey had um, experienced in um, Somaliland. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right at the start, right at the start of his career, the early part of the twentieth century. Yeah. So that was his first experience, but it was his his attention to detail which um, got all these things um, made them a success. It, 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 it's Husky. He becomes uh, really uh, works with closely with uh, Monty. Now I made I made a note to myself uh, that reads uh, Ramsey seems aware of Monty's tact problem. <laughs> I wonder how the two of them get got on together because obviously they, they work together at Husky and Overlord. Yeah, uh, they were completely opposite characters. I mean, um, Montgomery was the flamboyant soldier who loved publicity, liked having his picture taken, liked being at the centre of things, <clears throat> whereas Ramsey did not like um, personal publicity. Ramsey knew where Montgomery was coming from. He had to um, remind him several times about his role but generally they got on very well Rams, ramsey thought montgomery was a great was a great general with operation husky the invasion of sicily there were a number of plans which were put forward which both ramsey and um, montgomery did not like they came together with their own ideas and um, put those put those forward and i think i think it was montgomery's final plan that um, held sway He's such a big character. I almost wondered if uh, Ramsey was a way of almost offsetting, uh, from the British point of view, Montgomery's um, difficultness, uh, perhaps in coalition warfare with his American partners, if if uh, Ramsey could temper him almost. Ramsey um, could also be forceful about the way forward, but I think he was a bit more subtle than Montgomery. But, but yeah, they, generally they worked together 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 very well because oh, they, they, they come the same problem i think again uh, uh, when, when we look at uh, overlord Ram, ramsey gets does get the top naval job for overlord but i think monty straight away when he's shown the uh overlord plans he's poo-pooing it which presumably Ramsey ramsey's had a hand in from the start uh so does 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 ramsey agree with uh montgomery's criticism i think generally he did he did support him yeah of course, the, the naval side of, um, of the Normandy landings was Operation Neptune. You know, if, if Neptune had gone gone wrong, then Overlord could not have been a success either. Yes, I mean, Ramsey certainly came into his own uh, planning Neptune. But Montgomery essentially thought the number of divisions for the initial assault was too small. So 
that was increased. And Ramsey thought his naval force was too small, and he, he increased that as well. What's interesting about those landings, you know, Neptune, Overlord, it, 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 is they've been planning for such a long time, but then they almost have dry runs at Torch, Husky, and then when they come back to it, uh, they, they, they're they learning to increase numbers and change the plan. Exactly, yeah. and No, they gained a lot of experience from Torch and Husky um, because amphibious operations are not are not easy. Yeah, there was a, there was a very steep learning curve. But the completely bizarre thing is at this period... You know, Ramsey is going to be in charge of uh, the, na- the Navy at uh, uh, for, for those D-Day landings, but, but he's still officially retired, isn't he? That's right. I mean, he was he was playing such an important part in the in the war, but he was still officially retired. And uh, even Churchill found that bizarre. But the Admiralty was still stuck in its um, bureaucracy. Churchill had quite a job getting the Admiralty to put. Ramsey back on the active list. What's their objection? It's a kind of natural pecking order for promotion that only a certain number of admirals could be on the active list at one time. You would, you would have thought in wartime that they would have um, bypassed that and um, because Ramsey had already played such an important part in the war. You know, it was not a way to treat, uh, treat a hero. But Churchill prevailed and um, Ramsey was in the rank of acting admiral retired. Churchill made sure that he was promoted vice admiral on the active list one day and full admiral on the active list the next day. <laughs> so so uh, that was Churchill's response to um, Admiralty um, officialdom. The story of D-Day is pretty well known, but I presume from Ramsey's point of view, it, 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 he must have felt it went pretty well for him. It did, but um, D-Day was not, not the end of it. I mean, they had months of campaigning after that, and Ramsey was responsible for making sure that the fighting force on the ground was fully supplied. After D-Day, there was still a lot of work for the Navy and Ramsey, and he ended up moving his headquarters from outside Portsmouth to um, to northern France. Well, this is where he becomes active in uh, getting the problems of... Well, tell us about the problems of Antwerp. <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> Eisenhower was... A, Listen to Montgomery too much, and Montgomery's solution to a quick end to the war was Operation Market Garden, you know, the attack on the bridges in Holland. That turned out to be a complete failure, and they should instead have concentrated on securing Antwerp and the estuary that, that, it's, um, that led to it. But that was heavily fortified by the Germans. So in a sense, they were thrown off course by Montgomery. And it was only late in the day that they realised the importance of Antwerp because a lot of the other ports in France and Belgium had been sabotaged by the Germans so that they couldn't be used quickly. But Antwerp was captured quite quickly and intact. But it couldn't be used because the Germans had control of the sea leading to Antwerp. So no Allied ships could get in to use the port. Ramsey was very conscious of the importance of Antwerp and eventually persuaded Eisenhower to focus on that. And um, Montgomery eventually agreed. Mm, he's, he's very critical of Montgomery over his uh, overlooking Antwerp. Well, well um, Montgomery thought that he had this shortcut through Arnhem and from that direction and the war would be over quickly. But of course that failed. They should have focused as Ramsey thought, focused immediately on Antwerp. Uh, so one of his, um, well, I was going to, always giving the story away, but one of his last acts is to send Monty a £5 note. Is that on, is that on New Year's Day, 45? Why is he sending Monty a fiver? Montgomery had, um, had a betting book. He liked to accept bets from other military leaders on various things. Ramsey bet Montgomery that the war would be over by the end of 1944, and he put a fiver on it. And, of course, he lost the bet. Montgomery sent a letter to um, Ramsey, my dear Bertie, on the 22nd of December 1944, thanking him for his letter and a cheque for £5 for losing the bet. Montgomery wrote, I will see that it is duly recorded in my betting book 
that the debt has been paid. And he makes the point, I hope we should get this war won before next Christmas. And he, and he adds in his own handwriting, um, I won't give you my views on the present situation. I might say things I should not. <laughs> It's not like him not to worry about saying things. He usually managed to suffer from foot in mouth, does Monty? Yeah. No, there's, there was quite a lot of banter between the two. Yeah, Ramsey had to um, tick him off a couple of times for uh, overreaching. Well, I, I got the feeling that he, uh, that Ramsey was someone Monty actually listened to, that he, he respected enough to realise that when Ramsey was telling him something, he's someone who should be listened to. Yeah, yeah. No, they, they had... Um, it, it was a case of mutual respect. Because he could be mm. frightfully uh, self-centred and live in his own sort of, sort of bubble, could Monty? He could, yes, yes. Ramsey's killed on the 2nd of January, forty-five. How is that? Monty was um, based in Brussels, or near Brussels. Ramsey was at his headquarters in northern France, and he needed to go to see him to check on progress of the war. So he went to an airfield near his headquarters to fly to, uh, to fly to Brussels on the morning of January the 2nd, 1945. Put on a flying jacket, boarded a Hudson. The Hudson went off down the runway quite slowly, just before the end of the runway, got airborne, banked, and then nosedived. And um, all on board were killed, including Ramsey. And it was, it was his regular pilot as well, wasn't it? It was, a... it was his personal pilot, yes. So they had a very quickly set up a court of inquiry and uh, concluded that um, it was pilot error. It's a you know, d- dreadful tragedy so close to the end of the war. Do you do you think Ramsey gets the the recognition he deserves all this time later? No, I, no, he doesn't because, um, as I said, he wasn't someone who was like Montgomery chasing personal publicity. And of course, having been killed so near the end of the war he never had a chance to write his memoirs, whereas a lot of other military leaders did. <laughs> yeah, what well, Godby certainly did. <laughs> rewrite, his own mem- re- re- rewrite his own history. I could, actually, I quite like Montgomery. I mean, he's, um, I did read his memoirs, and he's, he's quite blunt and honest about uh, the way he approaches things and his views on <laughs> other people. Yeah. Well, um, Monty is a whole other topic. Uh, before we, before we disappear down that hole, we should perhaps, um, perhaps call it a day. Brian, thanks for joining me. Folks, if you want to know more about Bertram Ramsey, the book is Mastermind of Dunkirk and D-Day, The Vision of Admiral Bertram Ramsey. As ever, I will put a link on the website, www.podcast.com. Well, I think that's all from me for now, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.